Hey, welcome to Coffee Compiler Club. We're here today to talk about compilers and language runtimes and whether you should do locking or concurrency or state machines or CAS allowed in languages or not. So Leave and I have a fun conversation. Uh, and we have special guest, Guy Steele. Um, and uh, this meeting will be put up on YouTube within a couple hours, generally. Uh, and otherwise, we set agenda, although since Guy's our special guest, I'm going to let him start. Uh, I'll, I'm, I'm not actually going to do any intro other than to say, Welcome, Guy. And uh, if you, you're on mute, if you want to say something or start, and we'll go from there. Okay. Thank you for that welcome. Uh, I'm really not quite sure what to talk about, but I can talk about a couple of three things I've been doing recently and see if anyone is interested in them. Uh, one is kind of wrapped up, and that is the work that I've uh, done over the last nine years to uh, make uh, better random number generators uh, for use in parallel contexts. And uh, those are now installed in Java. There was a, a paper in uh, 2014 that led to the uh, creation of the splittable random class uh, within uh, uh, JDK 8, I suppose it was. And then uh, a later paper uh, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, Sebastiano Vigna and I uh, uh, constructed, investigated a class of generators called the LXM family. Uh, which are compound generators that combine a um, linear congruential generator with an XOR shift generator and then a nonlinear mixer on the end. And our paper mm -hmm. at a, uh, a couple of years ago explains why that particular combination is more powerful and better than previous combinations. And all those building blocks have been in the literature for a long time, but that particular combination had not been explored and tested carefully. So we did that. Mm -hmm. And that went into day 17. So that's random number generators. And the big deal there is that you can have a lot of them and use, uh, if you've got a lot of threads or a lot of parallel processes, each one can use an instance of this generator. And once they are created, they don't need to communicate with each other, but the mathematics shows that they ought to behave as a statistically independent. And that's the key. I did a, a big data startup called H2O some years ago. And one of the things we fought with was parallel distributed deterministic pseudo random number generators where you launch 20 to 60 threads per node and you'd have 100 nodes and so you'd have you know 10,000 rngs but everyone had to be deterministic so you get the same answer every time you ran it on a different size cluster or a different size whatever mm -hmm. so we we went and fought through that thing and i think we started somewhere one of the early things that were going on there and then did whatever was necessary to make it work on our situation. So yeah, I have to say it's it's I'm a big fan of RNGs. Uh they're a necessary building block. Fine. Okay, so you've worked in that space too. Another set of things I've just been doing is is working with uh uh Brian Getz and um and um Gavin Bierman on uh uh new features to go into Java over the last you know five or ten years and We've been working on things like string templates and uh, uh, pattern matching and switch statements and uh, support for record structures that are, uh, for example, you can have arrays of them where you don't have to have pointers to the structures. The, these record structures can be actually sort of part of the upper level uh, aspect of These are things like Project Valhalla and so forth. And um, my uh, participation in that has been kind of peripheral as as Brian and Gavin and John Rose and some others come up with ideas. They uh, usually um, uh, write up specifications and that's because I've got a history of the Java language specification. I will go over them and look for inconsistencies and better ways of saying things and so forth. So that's some involvement. Uh, the third and possibly the weirdest um, thing I've been involved with in the last year uh, has nothing to do with Oracle. Uh, this is uh, the verse language that uh, has been being uh, designed and promulgated by Tim Sweeney at Epic Games. And uh, he's apparently had this be in his bonnet for about the last 20 years about what he thinks a programming language ought to look like. And it's really interesting to work with him because sometimes his points of view are rather different from what I've been, the ways I've been used to doing yeah. things. So I've learned a lot by engaging with him. And How did the, you get involved with that in the first place? What What was the trigger for that? I'm sorry, that came, that comment came through my speakers as white noise or some audio problem. Did anyone else? I, I heard white you noise? fine. Hi, hi Guy. Uh, I was asking, how did you get involved? What, what, what drew you into that topic? 
I'm sorry, Cam, there's something about the audio I'm unable to make out your words. He, Cam is asking, how did you get involved? Oh, how did I get involved? I got involved because uh, Simon Peyton Jones, who, who is one of the people who's gotten involved with um, uh, Sweeney Decorate Games, and and he and uh, Colin Klassen and Leonard Augustin and Olin Shivers and some others apparently are now working part-time for Epic Games, uh, helping to develop this language, design and develop it. And so it's an interesting set of people, and I know a bunch of them, so this is, this is fun. But Simon gave a talk at a Haskell workshop last December, and Gavin Bierman attended. And when he got back, he sent me notes saying, you know, guy, you should look at, you know, the video of this talk. It's, you know, right up your alley, the kind of thing you might enjoy. So what what is the verse language main features? Again, Theodore, I'm sorry, I can't hear. There's something wrong. I'm just not getting audio clearly from you either. You're getting echo on, somebody's getting echo. Mm -hmm. um, Theodore now? is asking what was the, what's the main point of the verse language? And usually at this point, we'll ask for a link dropped in chat. And then we will drop that into our Google Docs as a public. I, I believe I put the link. The link's there now. Okay. Just a moment. I'm going to check my audio settings and make sure that I've got various kinds of auto uh, uh, echo suppression uh, done right. Um, so what I was saying was that Simon Peyton Jones is speaking in a, in a few weeks. So, I mean, he's probably much better at explaining the rest languages. But yeah, I'm definitely getting some echo too. Yeah, at this point, it's me and you guy with our with our mics turned on. So, I'm I'm typically never getting any echo. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm just getting I'm getting a slight buzz on your voice, but I can hear your words clearly, uh, Cliff. And I'm just and maybe I should uh, you know unlink and and reconnect and see if that makes it any better. But uh, let's keep going for now. Okay. Uh, Okay. Okay. So we've got two questions pending. One is, what is the verse language about? And yeah. the other is, how did I get involved? Okay. So I'm going to suspend that second one and talk about verse. Uh, verse is a language that is largely a functional language, but it also has aspects of logic programming. So um, imagine what a language might look like if it were mostly Haskell, but there were also equations. And when you write an equation, the two sides are equated through unification. So if they are variables and variables get unified, and if they are data structures, they get recursively unified. So it feels like a, an interesting cross between Lisp and Prolog, but uh, a cross or maybe between JavaScript and Prolog, but it's a particular combination that I haven't seen before. And what distinguishes Verse from previous attempts to combine function and logic programming is that it also uh, is determined to be uh, uh, entirely deterministic. So, um, In addition to having unification, it's also got a choice operator. And if you, any of you remember uh, Snowball or perhaps the Icon programming language from the 1970s, uh, superficially, the syntax of Verse looks very much like Icon, but Verse pushes it a lot further. Um, so Icon's got a choice operator. You can say X is assigned to either three or four or five. And Icon was implemented using a, um, uh, a chronological backtracking scheme. So it would try assigning three to X and then it would kind of proceed through the program. And if it ran into some kind of contradiction, it would backtrack and say, oh, well, three wasn't right, let's try four. And it would assign four to X and keep going. And if that fails, it would then try five. And if that failed, then the overall expression would fail. So there's this choice operator. And the other thing Icon did was to um, make control structures such as if then else and while do loops be predicated not on true versus false, but on success versus failure. What's so that? One, pardon? What's that mean? It means, for example, that here's a simple example. Uh, the greater than operator, if you compare x, if you ask, is x greater than 3? If x is greater than 3, then it succeeds. And if x is not greater than 3, it fails. So you can use it as a predicate if statement, but you can also use it just in a general expression as a kind of guard. Because, because once something fails, then, then failure propagates up through the expression tree until something finally catches that failure. So somebody else is asking, like, is this can this be made efficient? 
Oh, that's an excellent question. Yes. Uh, yes, it can. Uh, or yes, it's an excellent question. Uh, people like Tim Sweeney and Simon Peyton Jones think it can be made quite efficient. Uh, There's a lot of effort, you know, back in the day, Ralph Griswold, who developed Icon, put a lot of effort into developing Icon compilers that were reasonably good. But uh, there was some concern that this idea of using failure and chronological backtracking, which is an, actually an idea that goes back to the early AI languages, such as Carl Hewitt's work on Planner and uh, Gerald Sussman and Sussman McDermott Dermot, and uh, Charniak's work on Conniver. Uh, those were AI languages and they were actually trying to build fear improvers for AI. The idea, you know, okay, you got me ranging through all my, all my knowledge of programming language history now. Back in the 60s and 70s, uh, there was a series of programming languages designed to support artificial intelligence. Back when it was thought that the goal of artificial intelligence was to, uh, to do logic as perfectly as a human could. Now, humans actually, actually aren't very good at doing logic, we know this, but they thought that if they could uh, support fear improving, then fear improving would be what they needed to get a robot to right. do, do goal-based activities. Right, I remember. Reading there's a series stuff. of languages. A lot of them were developed at MIT, some in other places. And I'm working it, on a language to go unify or, or combine functional programming and sort of imperative style programming um, and with a minimalist syntax, but I'm not as far along as you guys are. So the idea was to try to prove theorems by considering alternatives, you know, one at a time and back, backing out of false branches if you ended up in a situation where you ran into a contradiction. Right. And we do this today when you read programming language like type theory papers that have these, um, these uh, inference rules yeah. and they're written with a horizontal <laughs> line and premises above and a conclusion below. Yeah. And uh, I gave a talk in 2017 pointing out that you can view that as a programming language that actually looks a lot like Prolog on the upside down. I just watched it this morning. It was a, a fun, fun talk. So if you view what's under the inference rule as the declaration of a procedure, say, if you want to prove this, then you need to prove everything that's above. Mm -hmm. It kind of looks like Prolog. And so in order to prove something below the line, you go through the premises one by one trying to prove them. And if any of them fails, and you say, oh, well, uh, that rule didn't work. Let's try a different inference rule. And so the choice of inference rules is non-deterministic. In principle, they can be tried in any order. But doesn't this go exponential on you really quickly? It can, if you're not careful. And so a lot of the concern in designing programming languages around this principle is constraining that exponential blow up and yeah. constraining the backtracking so it doesn't get out of hand. Yeah. So thank you. That guides me back to my comment about ICON. Uh, Ralph Griswold was really worried about that backtracking blow up an icon. And so the language very carefully constrains and limits how far the failure can propagate. And in fact, he so limited it, he limited it to single expressions. He wouldn't even let it backtrack to earlier statements in a procedure body. Mm, okay. Some ways, an artificial restriction. Um, so some might say that icon over restricted it. And perhaps Prolog under restricted it. Although Prolog has this thing called the cut operator, where the programmer can insert a claim that if you made it this far, then it's this or bust. You know, right. so if you, once you once you reach this cut, it says I'm going to commit to everything I've done so far. And if what follows fails, then everything I did before failed. Don't don't try alternatives. I remember trying to use the cut operator usefully in any larger program Prolog, and I never. It was difficult, to say the least, to use it usefully. Right. Okay. So let's so so, let's, so now let's, let's now kind of explain some of the background about having choice operators and use of chronological backtracking. And I'm going to back out to my earlier comment that, in some sense, verse looks like icon done a little more aggressively and a little more right. Um, okay. It does not constrain the backtracking quite as tightly. And uh, in some ways, it, it, it feels like a full-blown prologue. Um, and yet, syntactically, it looks an awful lot like JavaScript. And so you've oh, done interesting. it. Okay. And the, the, uh, the, the motivation for developing the verse language is actually a business goal of Epic Games, Tim says. He's trying to develop the new scripting language for all of their game products. Oh, I see. Who are they working with? Is this Epic or...? And he thinks that by using unification in this way, 
he will be able to scale in a way that, per, that pure functional programming languages won't. And his goal is to have a scripting language where literally millions of gamers can interact with each of them providing little fragments in the form of inference rules. So it's kind of a grand vision. We'll see whether it pans out. I, I Yes. Well, geez. I mean, I can imagine that the, the count of people trolling here with, you know, exponential and non-terminating fine. There's, but ah, it could be cool. Yes. Verse also has specific ways of limiting the backtracking, but they're a little more flexible, a little more general than what was done in Icon. In the Icon, okay. And to look at the detail, for the details on that, I'm simply going to refer you to the uh, paper that just appeared at ICFP uh, earlier this month. I got, um, I got a couple of questions here. First calculus, and I'm a co-author on that paper. Disclaimer. All right, all right. I'm, I'm going to take the... Uh... I'll take some questions in order from chat here. Cameron wants to know is how has your productivity skyrocketed since the dude in the office next to you left Oracle? How is my what skyrocketed? Oh, productivity. Oh, productivity. Um, productivity has been weird and it has nothing to do with people uh, leaving leaving the uh, the office. I think it has a lot more to do with the effects of the pandemic. Uh, yeah, okay, fine, yes. And, uh, and uh, we, we like, offices all over the world have scrambled to try to figure out how can we make can maintain reasonable working relationships while working primarily over zoom yeah right and yeah. The effect of that is that nowadays i think i think it's not giving too much away to say that our weekly staff meetings are still half zoom and half in person yeah and uh, members of the east coast labs are actually scattered all over the world now because there was just no reason for three years to make them come to massachusetts and now we develop the working relationships and everything's fine yeah okay Okay, um, so other questions I'll point out that I still have one question hanging, which is how did I get involved with Verse? Okay, and fine. I, I think I'm not in a position to finish that up in 30 seconds. Gavin Bierman pointed me to Simon Peyton Jones' talk about the Verse calculus. And on that, on the web page where the talk was hosted, there is also a draft paper. And uh, Simon was actively soliciting people to read the paper, please give us feedback. You know, we know this paper needs a lot of work, you know, anyone who wants to help us out. Well, I like reading papers and Simon's a friend of mine, you know, as are some of the other co-authors. So I thought, sure, I'll invest the same effort I would involve, I would, I would give to uh, reviewing any conference paper and give the same kind of feedback I would if I were a conference reviewer. So nice. I did that. And I found, I found the paper fascinating. So I found it worth investing 10 or 15 hours of my time to mark it up and send them comments. And when I was done, they said, wow, this is fantastic. Uh, would you consider being a co-author on the paper? And I protested and said, I'm just helping you guys out. And if I actually were a conference reviewer, that would not be ethical, but I wasn't. And after some back and forth, I ended up uh, you know, helping to push the wagon on a specific uh, proof that they needed for the paper. And that's really my primary interest. I'm not getting involved with the implication or further design of the language. But an interesting outstanding question is, They've designed this calculus to, 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 to explain the semantics of verse. It's a kind of featherweight verse, if you're familiar with featherweight Java and the other featherweight languages that appeared in literature. So the idea is to have a small lambda calculus and unification-based language that provides rewrite rules that provide a fairly concise semantics for the core of the language. And in, in any such uh, semantics, an interesting question is, is it confluent? Right. It's not confluent. You've got severe questions about the uh, the soundness of language. And um, Ranjit Jala managed to piece together a, a very, um, a real tour de force um, proof of a confluence of a subset of the rewrite rules. It's also known that the full set of rewrite rules cannot be confluent. Oh, really? Yes. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> And it has to do with a problem with let rec. And this is a problem that's been known in the literature for 20, 25 years. The lambda calculus can be confluent, let rec can't. But you can prove something related called skew confluence, where you, can, you can't prove that if two different sets of rewrites diverge, you can exactly bring them back together. But you can show that if two rewrite rules diverge, then starting from either one, you can produce a new term that has more information than the other one in a precisely defined sense. Oh, interesting. Okay. 
And you can do that either, and that's symmetric. So either can be made better than the other. And this has to do with substituting, if you substitute um, a copy of a recursive definition within that same definition, mm -hmm. then suddenly you've got one that has two copies of it. If you then do further beta substitution with that copy, you will only ever get an even number of copies. You can never get an odd number of copies. So by doing that recursive substitution, you've made a commitment to providing more information than necessary. You, you can provide six copies, but you can't provide five. So the idea of skew confluence is, well, you go down one path, you've got five copies, you went down this other path, you made the commitment to the internal substitutions, you can only provide an even number. So you are unable to provide uh, a matching term that has five copies, you can provide one that has six. And skew confluence right. effectively says, that's good enough, you did better than you needed to. Interesting, all right. Okay, so my, my piece of the puzzle is, I think I see my way to a complete proof of skew confluence for, the, for their complete calculus. And I've, I've been working on that for the last four, four or five months. Oh, wow, okay, yeah. And in doing, that was a great excuse to read some real classics of the term rewriting literature going all the way back to the 1980s. So that's what's in it for me is I get to read old papers. And okay, all right. People like Gerard Huey and, uh, and um, you know, other giants of the field had to say about that stuff. So I'm always in favor of a project that caused me to be more educated myself because I didn't know something. Okay, like so, having fun. That's thank you sure. for indulging me. I've now said everything I want to say about all previous questions. We can now return to the chat or however you want to run run this. Uh, oh session. gosh, you know, things have rolled on through here. So there's a question about uh, verse being debuggable for you know for game. You're going to use it for a game engine or game writing. It's it got to be debuggable. Is there any thoughts on how you know how it will debug or not, or is there like reverse debugging or what do you call it? Uh, record replay. Anything, everything. Yes, debuggability is an important issue. Um, that is one reason why uh, Sweeney has placed such an emphasis on the language being completely deterministic. So that's okay. one. Thing. Yeah, the language is set up in such a way that even when with the choice operator, the choice operator is not modeled as a non-deterministic choice among the, the alternatives. You will try them in order. And any results that are produced will always be reproduced in the same order and the entire line is deterministic in that sense. Okay. So you can always replay, which helps a lot. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, Leonard Augustin has been working on um, an underlying theory of how to do uh, asynchronous reads and writes, again, in a way that you can replay them deterministically. Yeah. And based on theories similar to what you used how you use monads and Haskell to control side effects are doing a similar kind of move inverse. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. And I know nothing about that. That's that's Leonard Spielewick. Um, so a question about doing static analysis if control flow is failure-based in verse. Um, I would think that would be straightforward. So any, any interesting things about that? So, so I got classic compiler static analysis, but I have this failure notion that propagates to like a throw catch kind of thing or try finally or something. Yeah. My, my hunch would be, sorry, sorry to interrupt. So my hunch would be that the choice operator can some code sometimes be at least a runtime because you don't know which choice the variables would take. So. Is it prone to a static analysis? So Theodore was thinking that because uh, you don't know based on the choice which one is taken directly at sort of compile time, but it's dynamic at runtime, what's the implications for debugging that? Uh, yeah, a good question. I should point out that my expertise in this arena is primarily in the verse calculus that is uh, presented in this paper. I'm aware that the language itself is a much larger language, uh, many features of which I don't know about. I am aware that there's a type system. I really don't know much about how it works. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I know they, they do a lot of static analysis. I don't know what that static analysis looks like. Okay. You know, I, I'm, the, I'm on my corner helping with one little piece of the formal semantics. Gotcha. 
Ooh, I see in the chat uh, that uh, Matt has uh, put in a link to, to a paper on formalizing Swift generics as a term rewriting system. Thank you, thank you. That's exactly the kind of paper I'd lo love to read. But I really appreciate that. that uh, Make sure it ends Matt, up in the Google Docs too. Matt is our resident librarian. Oh yeah. And, and by the way, Guy is a librarian as well. He has his own library at Sun Labs. It's called the Guy Brary. <laughs> I'm seeing a question from Mike Brown on whether I got anywhere with standardizing uh, the paper notation, like the inference rules from yeah. that team talk. And no, I've kind of put that on the back burner while I've uh, been, been uh, dealing with other stuff. And I've learned that my old colleague, Su Kyung Ru, who used to work on the Fortress project with me uh, at Oracle Labs, um, uh, has some students that are taking an interest in this. They may take that idea and run with it. It looked good to me. Yeah. I, I find that stuff hard to read, even with everyone's explanation, except because maybe it's because the, the syntax changes from paper to paper to paper to paper. Yes, an I'm interesting in that talk, much of the burden of the talk, 2017 talk I gave was to document the ways in which this language has sprung up informally. There is no centralized uh, description of it. There is no formal specification of it. There's really not even a good central informal specification of it. It's just this folk language has kind of grown up and right. it's developed problems because different people use it in different ways. The, the, uh, the syntax is inconsistent. And after I gave the talk, a bunch of professors came up to me and said, you know, my students have been complaining they're finding papers hard to read. Now I understand why. Well, it's precisely because uh, the, the, the notations are taken for granted. They differ from paper to paper. Uh, my conjecture is because of, uh, of paper page limits. Uh, authors are no longer taking the space to explain their notations. And it's just unclear where new students are supposed to pick up how this notation works. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. If they're not teaching it, and it's not documented anywhere. Um, have reading papers as a hobby. Da, 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 da. Students, well, well, we could we could change topics here or talk about something else. <laughs> oh, I wish Cameron that would have helped me. Oh. Yes, thank you. Cam asked about the the Fortress co contributor. That's Yuki Young Ru. Uh, she is a professor at KAIST, K A I S T which is sometimes called the Korean MIT. Ah, OK. Yeah, uh, what did you get out of Fortress? What was sort of the, can you you know give a, a one line summary of what was the main learnings from the Fortress work? OK, the main learning coming out as opposed to our ideas going in. The main thing I learned coming out is that if we had had a much better understanding of dependent types going in, we might have made a lot more progress. Oh, God, you were in, I didn't realize you were into dependent types there. Yeah, we're kind of, we were kind of thrashing around the edges of that without making a, a full-blown commitment to dependent types. And if we'd done dependent types, the, the whole type system might have been a lot more uniform and a lot, a lot, had, uh, had a lot better theory. I'm fighting type theory now and trying very, very hard to stay away from dependent types. Um, I'll find out if I succeed. Yeah, there are certain tools like dependent types, like theorem provers, yeah. uh, uh, like... Uh, uh, quantum programming. <laughs> the uh, language designers over the next 10 or, 15, 10 or 20 years are going to have to make you know some serious decisions about each of these. Am I going to commit whole hog to that or not? You know, is is that going to be a necessary thing in the future? Right. And uh, possibly uh, lo logical unification is another. Versus versus just how to make a commitment to unification. It's not making a commitment to quantum programming yet. And right. uh, and I'm unsure as to whether their type system is edging toward dependent types or not. I've made a commitment to unification and I'm trying to stay away from dependent types, but I have, but I'm expanding the borders of unification. We'll find out if I get caught myself. Yeah, but I've seen to me the programming language theorists have developed, you know, six or eight or 10 really powerful theory sledgehammers for, uh, for uh, tackling programming language design monads is another. And I'm struggling to try to keep up with them all. And I'm wondering, you know, whether, you know, any, any new designer is going to have trouble, you know, getting, getting his or her head wrapped around all of them. Yeah. yeah. And we end up discarding some of them along the way. History works that way. Well, there's always an explosion in complexity before someone brilliant 
comes along and actually finds a way to simplify it. So yeah. when you're in the middle of the explosion of complexity, everything seems intractable, seems irreducible. So the magic is that someone has to innovate, explode the complexity, and then someone else, usually someone else, comes along and says, you know, this really doesn't have to be this complicated. We can reduce it to these following rules. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was, you know, Lambda Calculus did that at some point. There's been some concurrency work, I think, that simplified a bunch of the last several, well, last decades. Um, Levo, yeah. There, there's a, there is a, a wall that makes good ideas this hard, difficult to come a paper. That's an unrelated question or unrelated topic, though. One of them is you got to learn the lingo, so you have to have the background, or else no one else will understand what you're talking about. And then you discover that a lot of what you thought was cool has been done before, and, and now something you're doing that is cool has to be teased apart from other things that other people have done and then expressed in the same way that they've been expressing it, except for the delta that's new and different that you're doing. And that turns out to be a lot of work. Good point. I want to pick up on this comment in the chat about why PLT Redux hasn't seen broader adoption. Yeah, that's a good question. I like PLT. I like Racket. And uh, PLT Redux uh, is a, a reasonable framework for that kind of inference rule stuff. <laughs> That maybe the answer is this, answer that is the same as the answer to the question why hasn't Scheme uh, you know remained in charge of the world why have people why do people adopt Scheme so with welcome arms in the eighties and early nineties and then kind of abandoned it again you know Scheme is still in use but uh, I would say well, first of all Haskell provides some attractions and the and the, the Haskell, my static typing you know types and uh, and thereby enabling the work on monads and stuff like that. Um, but uh, there's just also this divide between people who really like parenthesized languages and those who don't. <laughs> maybe if PLT Redux were done all over again in a, maybe even in a Haskell framework or maybe in a JavaScript framework, maybe it would catch on, I don't know. But it, it sometimes, sometimes uh, things that we think are just only tangential issues really have a strong effect on, on, on uptake of an idea by a larger population. Yeah, guy, can you my... hear me now? Guy, can you hear me now? Go ahead. Go, Cameron. Guy, can you hear me? I don't think so. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll say, take it in chat. We hear you. All right. I was just going to comment that when I had my head wrapped around parentheses writing languages, it worked. And when I stepped away for a couple of years, you know, five or 10 years, going back to them is like painful. And then, but we have questions people are trying to ask, and I'm just filling here. Um, yeah, Cameron, your your sound sounds very stuffy from your mic there. It has something to do with what you're doing. Uh, okay, so Simon's asking virtual threads in Java as a concurrency unification strategy of some kind, like async versus async await versus just launching threads that are very expensive from the OS versus. I don't know, Erlang, actor model, and then here's Java virtual threads. Is this yeah. like a solution to concurrency or not, or unification? I think I think my point is that it's interesting uh, in terms of uh, somebody comes along and simplifies things again that we kind of ended up where we started. So we had threads and then they're, well, they were expensive and it was kind of, unwieldy to get values out of them. So we got futures and tasks, and then we had all the um, functional or callback-based APIs, and people couldn't use their go-tos and their continues and their breaks and their exceptions in them, so they didn't like that. So they invent invented async await uh, to basically fix the syntax again, and then they realize, well, functions have these colors now. There are like async functions and non-async functions. And basically, if you program well enough or long enough, uh, all your functions become async in, async in the end. And then Java comes along and says, well, maybe we should just try making uh, threads cheaper. 
And from a language perspective, or from a language complexity per complexity perspective, it's interesting to me because uh, maybe the approach with virtual threats is not better than futures and promises, and it's not better than async await. But from a language footprint, it's much cheaper because it doesn't invent these new concepts like um, async await, for instance. And um, I think it's cheap interesting threads. to watch what happens there. Yeah, I'm, I'm voting for cheap threads. It's easier to wrap my head around it if I have sequential <laughs> processes that communicate. Yeah, I, I did the JSON, not JSON, JavaScript, web interfaces, React, whatever, async await was a pending nightmare. Fine. All right. Uh, so has uh, has Guy any any opinions in this area, or is it is it just a, a not a core focus of you? I guess I don't have strong opinions. Uh, generally speaking, I've I've been in the field long enough, over fifty years now, that I've I've seen several such cycles come around of. You know, things getting complicated and someone coming up with a, a simplification that looks very similar to where things were 20 years ago. Maybe it's just enough different to have made some kind of marginal improvement. And meanwhile, you successfully discarded some of the accreted stuff that it re really isn't needed. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess um, as regards threads and how cheap they should be and so forth, I'm all, I'm all for eliminating overheads. But I'm more interested in the in the cycle where we keep moving back and forth between excitement over asynchronous threads and excitement over SIMD operations. And I've seen SIMD, you know, come into favor in the 80s and then fall out of favor again in the 90s and then kind of come back into favor and fall out. And uh, that waffling back and forth is very interesting to me. And uh, we're seeing SIMD in ascendance again in the last decade with the uh, uh, rise of interest in machine learning algorithms, deep learning and stuff, and executing them on GPUs. And while GPUs can, to some extent, do uh, MIMD programming, uh, it turns out that uh, the people just trying to get machine learning done have, in effect, built SIMD languages. Again, PyTorch is essentially a SIMD language. And uh, so there's interest in those again. And it will be interesting to see whether they then begin to branch out and say, well, it'd be a little better if we could have these threads be just a little bit independent and, and we may go around the cycle again. Is my audio any better? A yes. little bit. A little bit? Yeah. So, okay, um, yeah, uh, Guy, I'm curious, have you gotten to look at parser combinators at all? Because one of our, one of our other members here, Jamie Willis, is the author of one you may know, Parsley, Parser Combinators? Parser Combinators, yes. Yep. So, Jamie okay. Willis, Jamie Willis, who's on the call, he, he wrote Parsley, which is written in, he wrote a version in Haskell and he wrote a version in um, Scala of a Parser Combinator library. Yes. Jamie, you want to say I anything? Uh, I guess I don't have any special comments to make about that. I mean, I'm interested in parsers, and I'm interested in, in parallel parsers, and and interesting ways of making it easier to build parsers. And parser combinators is is a great approach, but I don't feel like I've really got any expertise there. Ah, uh, no comments from Jamie. So, so it was a so it was a coincidence that you ended up inventing a new approach there, or is it? All right, Jamie. I'd like, hear more, I'd like to hear more from Levo about uh, uh, this uh, very strongly expressed opinion about hating the idea of a user writing multi-threaded code. You know, please say more. Um, okay, it it's my audio to fine. cause a lot of the bugs. Yes, audio is fine. Okay, yeah, it's at eighty percent. If I need to raise it, just let me know. Um, so. I noticed that when a user has to write uh, locks, they tend to make mistakes, especially when they accidentally uh, have functions that are re-entrant. And um, it's, the, the compiler doesn't really um, 
you can't type checks locks like saying this always has to be locked before that or uh this like i i think that a type system needs to help you with locking a lot more than what most languages do so i kind of like the idea of you writing of writing code and then the library uh just um does what you want but i think the library also has to be low level enough that it's not going to introduce any overhead but uh, i still haven't uh, figured it out but i just know that uh locks and atomics cause a lot of problems at least for my code my bread and butter for 40 years cliff uh you're a special case and I, I was able to handle my atomic, so I think I might be a borderline, but it's still very difficult. All right. I, I, you know, I have a strong opinions on this stuff, but mostly because I've been doing it for so long and I watch other people do it wrong and I can't tell them not to do it that way and they have to try and kill themselves. So, okay, fine. That's, that's exactly why I don't want other people writing the code. <laughs> there, there's surely a theory there that I could put into some sort of theoretical framework and that might turn into a language thing. Although I certainly, I want to say I, I've seen people do things with locks that were, you know, language supported for locking somehow. And um, I don't know, they don't always get it right, but there's been more efforts than than none. Um, I don't know. I don't have an answer. If I did, I would have been jumping up and down. See, I really like the idea of just uh, having uh, th uh, th threads not have access to global data. Uh, maybe read access is fine, but I like the idea of um, it looks like you're just writing single threaded code, but you have to pass in uh, all the data it can access or it produces it on its own. Like they so, can allocate. Yeah, you have data. to have the global shared cache. Right. This immediately. Yeah. Uh, you need a hash table. Definitely. Right. You, yes. You need a global shared concurrent hash. And now. But I, I like to reduce uh, aliasing as much as possible. That's what I think uh, threading really th needs. Those are sort of separate issues. The global shared concurrent hash is like a requirement. Somebody has to build it. If you're like Erlang, you just say, I have a database in the middle. That's my global shared concurrent cache. But you I can't agree write that. one in Erlang, but you can get cool shit done in Erlang. So you could write a language where this one particular property is provided as a base primitive by the language, but everyone else is either doing, you know, mutable single threaded or immutable read only. Um, that, you know, there's, there's things there, but if you have, but somebody has to implement the concurrent shared cache. And that means you need a language for that. Or well, I would like a language for that. I'd like to tell a story for, about a little project that I worked on probably, what was it? Probably 25, 30 years ago, somewhere in there. It was probably late 90s, possibly the early aughts. And this is the work on, um, we were thinking about uh, concurrency primitives and uh, realized that compare and swap, while kind of the best thing being offered on hardware at the time, was really hard to use to implement certain kinds of algorithms. And so our conjectures, would, we, if we only had a double compare and swap where, where you could lock two memory locations, verify both their values, and then update both of them conditionally, that might be enough to do the job. And then after some months, uh, uh, the people I was working with and I came up with an algorithm for implementing a double-ended queue. And it turned out the, the algorithm had mistakes in it and we had to fix it and so, so forth. But um, so we finally published a paper on how, how to implement a, a double-ended queue using double compare and swap. And uh, many people's reaction was, oh, cool, maybe double compared swap really is the answer to all the world's problems. My reaction was, if just implementing a double-ended queue is a publishable paper, then this primitive is way too hard to work with. And, uh, and so it was, and we abandoned that and then uh, so did some uh, further work there at the Sun on more general transactional memory where you could lock any number of things in effect by making a memory transaction. And I worry that even transactional memory may be too hard. It, I, I worked on hardware transactional memory with, with a serious good transactional memory size. And I investigated and worked fairly closely with a, a large number of people, like three large groups doing software transactional memory. They both have a failure mode. Um, and the Azul hardware transactional memory would be anything that fits in your L1. So you would start a transaction, as long as you didn't evict a line, then when you hit the in transaction, the L1 would now 
proclaim everything atomically available across the cluster. And um, if in the middle you evicted a line, you lost the transaction, but if you re-ran, you had more things cached typically. And after a few goes arounds, you quit evicting lines and you would get it if no one was competing with you. So if you were just trying to lock a, a standard Java hash map that was, or hash table, whatever, some atomic version or concurrent version, locked version, get it right, your locked version, and you wanted to have multiple threads run through, the story was that it typically worked as you'd expect. The transactions could be limited by hardware accidentally to be small, but were typically allowed to be quite large because um, you only had four-way associativity. So you could get four bad addresses and they would conflict. You could never get the transaction to go. And we worked out issues where we had repeated fails. We had to switch to locks. And we worked out issues where we had uh, some number of things that were lightly touching. And we had issues where it wasn't worth doing the transaction. You just do a biased lock and we'd get all that worked out. And the real story comes is that because there's no feedback to the user about why their transactions fail, the, the people write code that is not transactional, hardware transactional memory friendly. They put a mod counter. So if I have multiple threads reaching into a hash table that are doing mutations on different lines, there's no shared common cache lines. They should be updating memory independently and you can make them both atomic. In practice, they both touch the mod counter with the write game over, you can't be atomic. And of course they had no clue why they couldn't be atomic and you had to take a lot. So the hardware transactional memory there failed in practice on large, speeding up dusty deck large Java programs because people just didn't know how to write, didn't know how to change their code <clears throat> to make it atomic memory. You could imagine a compiler that gives you link warnings. It was all runtime things you would have to get warnings on, typically. You needed somebody to come through and say, I ran a transaction. This guy ran a transaction. We both failed on each other. We then sorted out our cache lines, talked back and forth, and gathered up some data. And after a while, we could come along and say, profiling says that probabilistically we're failing here. That was the normal issue we ran into. And we could gather that. I didn't have any good way to feed it back to people. If we had individual lock setups or locky like things that were failing um, at, at a certain kind of a rate, we would do trade-offs between taking a lock periodically and retrying, like there might be an initial setup where you flooded in things. Then your cache got full and people didn't write very often into the full cache because they usually got a read hit. And then we go back to the transactional stuff. We, we kind of worked that out, but the, the common failure mode was you updated something stupid that you didn't care about, like a, like I said, a perf counter that was how many how many counts, um, and that failed. The other piece was uh, the software side. I worked with three different groups, and they started with a software trans transactional memory implementation as somebody's research project of some kind, often published somewhere. And they worked with their application, and they were using that instead of locking, and they would hit typically bad cases in the STM where they would have endless retries or very expensive high overhead situations. So they go optimize the STM <clears throat> because they knew what would trigger the STM to go into this bad situation. They go back and they optimize the application to not hit this bad case in the STM. And then they go back to the STM and optimize it some more and they go back and forth. And after about a year or two years of this, they realized that they didn't really have an application with a software transactional memory. They had a merged system that was really a wad of here's how we have concurrency implemented in our system today. I can't really say it's an STM anymore. I can't really say it's an application that has a uniform nice layer that I do transactions against. That's not what they ended up with. And that was three different groups came to that same conclusion. Um, and that's where I decided that STMs weren't really going to work either. So that's my history of Transactional memory. I don't know the, what the right answer is for large scale concurrency writing for everybody. So you think STM is completely unfixable or do you think that maybe the right language or the right tooling might save it? Something else has to come along to save it. I think it's not unfixable, but there are things that work well in an STM mindset and things that do not. And maybe the right language would steer you to, oh, this is we're going to do an STM on. It's fine. And this, I really fucking need to take a lock. 
or I'm going to go to a library routine that somebody else wrote the double ended Q on and I don't want to look and care or think about it. Yeah, uh, yeah, transactional memory. Yeah, Cam. I like I said, I've, I've tried them both. We, we would have to have a discussion about what your intended use case is before I could recommend using an STM. I think Levo's point, though, is basically, you know, concurrency is hard. Programmers mess it up. And yeah. Well, your ecstasy is an effort to pull concurrency out of user hands and go True. to the ruling model. True. Um, and I think we can add in exactly the missing shared concurrent yeah. cache primitive. It's a little disappointing that Erlang didn't didn't cite us as an inspiration, but I guess they came first, so that's how it works. Yeah, that's, that's the special property that Cobalt has that nobody else on the planet has. They, they well, were alive in the 60s. Because I didn't realize we had copied Erlang until someone said, have you ever looked at Erlang? And I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, I thought you... <laughs> Really? Really? Because I thought you just assumed, hey, Erlang did this thing. It worked pretty well. Let's see if we can do better. I yeah. mean, this is this is the challenge in software is so many people are inventing so many things. I can't keep up with it. Yeah, so this has been so, a real illustration of, uh, of, of, uh, of the difference between um, a technology that is quite effective in experts' hands and one that can be sort of made generally available and used by the average programmer. I, I still believe very strongly in transactional memory is an excellent model for, for organizing things. And we, it was central to design a fortress. We didn't make a lot of headway in implementing it. But uh, sometimes I wonder if it's sort of in the same, same league as garbage collection, a really important technology in every language, but also the expert should implement it and then should kind of you know, hide there under the covers and do its thing without uh, the users having to worry too much about it. Because while non-experts can often implement it and use it safely, they often can't get good performance out of it. Or if they try to take shortcuts to get the good performance, then they destroy the very properties that made it safe. Right, right. Yeah, garbage collection lands in that category. I mean, there definitely was a time when I thought the future was going to be describing all of our problems as associative functions over trees so that I didn't care how it got wrapped up, which I think was one of the ideas that was sort of core to Fortress. Is that right? Uh, yes, it was, and um, not a new idea in Fortress by, by any means, but uh, it's it's actually the key to the organization of some of the more exotic SIMD algorithms. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. And if it can be used in the uh, in the non SIMD context as well, so much the better. Uh, if you, yeah, if you go back and look at the uh, paper that, that Danny Hillis and I wrote back in uh, 1986, I guess data parallel algorithms. And a, a fair chunk of it is just uh, uh, exhibits using uh, parallel prefix algorithms in somewhat unexpected ways because you're manipulating symbols or pointers rather than numbers, but it's still the same set of ideas. Right. Uh, doing something that looks like it ought to take linear time in log time because you can organize it as a tree in parallel prefix uh, gives, gives you the same effect as, as the, the carry ripple in an adder. You know, it looks like it ought to be linear, but by building the correct kind of carry tr carry propagation tree, you can do it in a long time. That's what parallel prefix is about. Hey, Matt, you want to look up the paper, maybe? See if Matt's listening in. Yeah, Cameron's laughing at me. <laughs> yeah, you got Matt. a library and you use them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, communications of the ACM 19, 1986, I think it was December, but I'm not sure. Wow. I have memory that state dates back for decades for things like Z80 machine code opcodes, but not papers and not people's names. I told you the guy still keeps that punch card in his office that, that he, he can still explain what the holes mean. <laughs> That's correct. That video yeah. was great. There are times programs have I, less I, weight. I still remember the numeric codes for certain characters in Ebsidic. Oh, Epsidic. I've not really used for 40 years, but it's some of it's still stuck in my head. Like I'm uh, pretty sure it's the asterisk. I lose my page. Here it is. All right. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, there's always moments like that. The day I realized that I had accidentally memorized the SHA-256 of nothing because I needed that enough in debugging things. Yep. There you go. Yep. Okay, if you just um, think over and over, you find it's, it sticks in your memory. Yeah. There's an interesting question with the how much do you target allowing experts to do expert thing versus allowing beginners to do anything. 
because we're in this weird profession where the number of programmers in the world has basically doubled every two years since Alan Turing, which means at any given time, half of the programmers in the world have two years or less experience. Oh God, this is the exponential growth problem. Holy crap. And I mix this with uh, my great grandfather was a goldsmith and he was, he used to say that if you want to be a good goldsmith, it takes at least three generations. That someone does a bunch of experiments and learns things, and then they try to teach it to the next generation, but they can't because they never learned the stuff. They only learned it from experimenting, so they don't know how to teach it. But that generation had to go through all the struggles of experimenting and actually learning it from someone. So when they teach it to the third generation, the third generation actually understands it because they were taught it by someone who knows what the experience was to learn it from a person. Oh. And I worry if we're getting to this point of like, Maybe it takes three generations to be a good programmer and that our tools are in this weird position of like, to some extent, every language needs to be a teaching language because someone has to teach you how to use it well. That if you just hand someone a software transactional memory and say, have fun, well, they're the first generation and it's the third generation that's really going to get good at using a lot of these tools. I have a huge ton of concurrency algorithm implementation stuff in my head that I can look at a problem and tell you it's suitable, it's not, and use this technique. But I have not. But did you discover it or were you taught it? Oh, no. No, this was brutal, brutal learning the hard way. I'm your first generation experimenter. I don't know how to teach it. I've been looking for how to teach it. But I, but it takes a different right. set of, it takes a different set of skills. So, um guy I, I assume you're in lexington today is that a like is that your like yeah so uh we have another so martin fowler lives here in boston as well and um and he always amazed me because he would ask me technical questions and i would think wow he doesn't really understand this does he and then he'd write a book and he would explain all this stuff and people could read his book and know how to do it these complicated technical things and i thought that is a gift, like the ability to take these. He, I don't even know, and I'm not exaggerating, he may tell you this is true or false or whatever. I don't even know if he still understood it after writing the book, but people who read the book understood it. And that's that's the magic, right? Like the ability to turn concepts into teachable things on yeah. paper. The, the problem- yeah, If you want a good science sci reporter, find someone who loves science and is terrible at it. Because by the time they understand it, then it was explained well. But then by the first generation, we already have a, such a different techniques to approach a single problem and the, and the, the, the things just getting worse, how, how to approach it. I mean, how to approach the teaching of it? Like, we can't agree on the best way to do concurrency. So, oh. you know, your options are like, teach them all and see what sticks or something. Hmm. I, I got something to demo if you guys uh, want to see it, but uh, it's, I don't know how related it is, but it, it's learning something different. And Bebo wants to show code. Let's yeah, change gears. Work. Okay. Fine. We can change gears. Fine. We'll show code. Here. Okay. Um, I'm bad at Zoom. Uh, yeah, yeah I haven't to, have to turn on sharing yet, I think. All right. See, All right. see now if you can share. Okay. It looks like it can. Um, let's do entire. Levo is our our resident low level C hacker dude, C C plus plus hacker dude. And he's busy doing different language things and then implementing editors in a couple of days and then getting them <laughs> linked up to debuggers or language <laughs> servers. And it's, uh, you, you've been doing some good. I stuff. write a lot of code. <laughs> he's also and been the... very certain he knows how to solve the general problem of doing memory management in a statically precise way until we poked holes at him and he's been. Pivoting left and right on cool things and thinking about this solution he has in his head. And I really hope he gets away to the point where he can pull out the solution he's got in his head and express it in a, a meaningful way. I think you guys have a mental block that's preventing me from explaining it, but uh, I'll, I'll try again another day. But okay. uh, I can we'll call that first with. generation. I've got a race between him and, and uh, you know, $100 on the first person to do one of the two with Alan and his, his programming language. Uh, toy implementation or whatever, yeah, programming language design. I, I just want you to write code. I don't want the $100. <laughs> but I, I'm ready to demo if you guys are ready. 
Uh, Go ahead. I'm ready. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in my language, uh, colon equals means uh, something is mutable. Uh, assignment just means it's uh, it's uh, immutable. And uh, this is just simple code. Now, the problem here is I changed the state and this no longer works. Uh, I would imagine that most people, when they write code like this, they didn't mean to change the state and it should be down here. But uh, since this is um, like an incubator or a relative, uh, this works completely fine. Like you can see your prints part one, does not print part two and whatever. But I implemented this where if you uh, do an assignment, which means you overwrote the thing, uh, you get a compiler saying that, uh, well, this is, I, I, this is supposed to be a secret feature. So uh, I, if I accidentally release this, you just get some vague some error. Message. You didn't fix so, it. So what is the some error you didn't fix? What was the dot Pardon? equals? State dot uh, equals. Dot equals means this uh, mutates uh, mutable variable. Okay, so special syntax to overwrite the original value of a mutable variable. Yeah. Fine. So okay. the reason why this uh, causes an error, and this is, uh, I, I never liked um, um, functional languages because it doesn't fit my mental model, and my mental model is basically what the hardware does. So uh, the reason why this uh, errors out is because uh, state. First, you initialize it, which means you have unlimited writes. Then you read it, which happens in the if statement. Then you wrote to it. And at this point, it assumes that if you read this variable, it, you, you probably uh, did it by accident. Why? So this now becomes an error, which is correct. Okay, because wait, wait. You why is it an to... error? Why is it an error to read after write? There's the whole point of immutable variables. You're going to write to it. Well, so, you can write then... to it as many times as you want until you read from it. So you it. want like a or, final write where there's a last write that's allowed. Well, I, I think it's error prone uh, to do a read after a write because the way you should fix this is- uh, you put the, the, What you, you should fix it depends on what your intention is, which I can't tell from the code. In, yeah, in that so, case, how do you write a traditional while loop with a mutable index? You know, while i less than whatever i plus plus. Because that would write to it, and then you read in the next iteration. How does it handle that? Here, state uh, is statically known. So, what? How it handles something that it doesn't know? You just have to know at runtime. Uh, the branches um, have an uh, branches affected differently, and uh, I, I don't want to go into uh, the entire thing because uh, you know this is just supposed to be a short little demo. Right. But um, I, I just want to say that instead of having um, um, like functional languages or uh, have everything uh, immutable. I kind of like the idea of mutating, but have uh, rules in such as this. Because uh, if you wrote code, if you wrote, uh, if you put the condition in the condition variable, then it's completely clear. You don't get the error and you execute both parts as expected. So now, if you actually did want to, uh, uh, if you did want to mutate, you can do uh, new states. You can change, uh, change variables. State equals yeah. five. So, do so this. The thing I've been doing in AA is just have a final write that says no more writes after this point. But I'm allowing you to read at any point. You're kind of claiming that once I read, the value of state is frozen. I can't really mutate it and read it again. If I can't read what I mutated, there's no point in mutating it either. So the write to state equals five, state dot equals five, I would claim. It happened after a read. It's already a final field now. You can't do it. And I don't know that this works. I like, like you're kind of saying, I have a thing where I can write to it as many times as I want. And then if I read it, it's locked. I can't write it. I can't read it after writing again. So it changes state, state. after the, the read to become error to read it again after writing. And then if I write to it, now it's error to touch it. Uh, I, so I claim you could simplify that just saying I have a final write and then, then I can't do any more writes and it's a compiler error to have more writes. So the way I attempt to fix that is um, if you, you can do something like um, original states equals states, and then you can yeah. write to this. And if you want the original, like- um, No, your, your con makes You can just sense. separate, you can separate, um, I think you can just separate, um, um, how do I say this? 
you could just put the variables in separate variables and then you could just read the old values or read the new right. Var right, values. Right, right, right. Having mutated it, you want two copies, an old and a new. And you want to make sure the user gets the right one. So you're saying, don't go reading it after you wrote it because you don't, I, it's ambiguous whether you want the pre-write or the post-write value. Yeah. Okay. And so and I, and then you have a special cutout for loops so that you can say like in the- Yeah, it here. sounds like this would get uh, getting your way a lot, but so far it has not gone my way. But I don't 100% sure if my rules yes. are uh, correct because I'm more- Well, you wrote big enough in code in it, yes. Yeah. Yeah, right. Right, yeah. larger. Write a larger project in it here. I think, and 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 yeah, yeah. Find places where things. you want to have more mutations on purpose that you then want to read afterward, and you want to have you're going to have to have a one that says this guy actually mean whatever the current right. value is after I wrote it. Like, like I started with, um, I I did like a plus equals at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, when you mutate a variable, is it mostly assignments or is it mostly uh, relative assignments, like a like an accumulator doing a plus equals? Oh, yeah, like an uh, an operator. No, when I mutate, sometimes fair enough. It's it's actually mutation. I'm running a compiler IR. I'm doing a people operation. I'm taking a graph of data structures. I'm mutating to modify the graph. It's an update in place, and I intend to read it again. It's not a, an accumulation like effect. Uh, they you you the basically want the developer to write static single assignment. Don't they need a fee node? Well, um, that's why I have special cases for if statements. Right. Yeah, he's, yeah. I do notice that Levo's code often is the output of the compiler, not the input. And I actually working with Cliff is quite interesting because quite often reading Cliff's code, I'm like, this is what I would expect the compiler to output, not what to feed into the compiler. <laughs> But I want you to look at that code and say, what is the 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 what I is mean, the your extra source code. thing outside of the comments? Because when I fight fast, I'm skipping the comments. They'll come later. Yeah. Oh no, I'm not saying it's a bad thing either. It's that no, I don't you're so, you're I don't so really... used to generating right. the output that when you think about how to do it, you often write your code kind of post transformation. Fine, that's been that way all my life. Yeah, exactly. I, uh, I, I don't in high school, the teacher either. would ask me to write the write the problem on the board. I'd go up, I'd write the opening line, and I'd skip a few steps because they were all done in my head as one big thing. And I wrote something in the middle, and then I'd write the solution at the end, and like this. And she said, "Why are you in between steps?" Said, there are no in between steps. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. But anyways, I I was just like um like I I had this feature, and I just like never heard of anyone speak about it before. It's the, and I, I know people like functional programming, but I, I don't know why they don't add in mutation rules because this hasn't gone my way so far, but um, I, I do got to write a lot more code. I, I claim but I'm I, fooling with the mutation rules AA with having a final write as opposed to a final field. But why don't we kill the share here because you're popping back yeah. and forth. Yeah. Yeah. So there must be more questions. And if there are no more questions, Guy always has interesting stories. <laughs> well, I want to talk about quantum computing. Like, I don't know. Right. Speak up, Alan. I said I wanted to talk about quantum computing. Yeah, we we it came around in your comments, Guy, and then yeah, and then Alan popped up, and it's way back in the chat. I find it here. Right. I mean, I in, how do we program these things? We have decent ideas of what the quantum yeah, gates are, but not as good what the quantum languages should be. <laughs> the question is, what is the minimum effort you need to do to support quantum computing, you know, in a growable manner? Well, you need to have a, access to a quantum computer. Well, yeah, let, let me suggest. I mean, uh, you can simulate them up to a certain size. I'm going to start by suggesting this uh, Google search term. Open QASM. I just put it in the chat. And uh, this is essentially uh, an open standard for a quantum computing assembly language. And mostly what it consists of is you can declare, um, you can declare uh, essentially red bits or, cube or quantum bits. You can, scare, you can declare classical bits, quantum bits. And you can declare them either singly or as registers, which are essentially one dimensional arrays of them. And what you can do with a classical bit is test it to see whether it's one or zero. And this gives you some conditional control flow. 
And what you can do with a quantum bit is uh, reset it to the zero qubit. So you can reset its state. You can um, apply what's called a unitary rotation matrix to it, which, which can cause, its, uh, cause it to go into a superposed state. For example, if you rotate a qubit that's known to be in the zero state, if you apply the correct rotation, then it will be half zero and half one in, in the, the weird, so it's a superposition in the quantum sense. And by applying other rotations, you can uh, change the relative phase of those superpositions. If you know anything about quantum mechanics, you know that essentially um, a quantum bit is a superposition of the zero and one states, and each of those each of those zero and one states has a uh, coefficient that is a complex number. And the square of the complex number is not the square, the, uh, sorry, the magnitude of the complex number is the probability that if you measure the qubit, you will find it to be in that state. So a, one of the standard rotation matrices is called the Hadamard matrix. And it will take something that's definitely in a zero state or definitely in a one state and put it into a state that's half zero and half one. Okay. Well, I was looking- there, Thereby, thereby and, and then there's another kind of gate called a conditional knot, which is often described in this way. If the first qubit is zero, leave the second qubit alone. And if the first qubit is one, then toggle the second qubit. That is flip it from zero to one or one to zero. That's actually a very classically minded description of it because each of those qubits could themselves be in superposed states. So we should really say that to the extent that the first qubit is a zero, leave the second qubit alone. And to the extent that the first qubit is a one, then flip the second qubit. And to the extent it's really described by more of these rotation matrices that can, that can change the superposition, change the relative phase and so forth. And uh, so the third thing you can do with a, with a qubit is measure it. And that causes its state, uh, according to the quantum mechanics model, causes its state to collapse to definitely a zero or definitely a one. And the measurement operation gets that value out and, put, and puts a copy of it into, the class, into a classical register as a classical zero or one bit. So three operations on qubits. Uh, doing one of these matrix rotations, doing a conditional knot between two of them, and using one as the control and the other as the thing being operated on, and finally being able to um, measure a qubit, thereby collapsing its state and producing a classical bit. And then on the classical bits, you can do various things that you want to do. You know, you could, it's easy to extend the language by providing an arbitrary classical language on the side, like Python or Scheme or whatever. But uh, this is kind of viewed as the minimal set of quantum primitives on top of which you can then prepare macros to do other interesting things. Wow. Yeah, I have to think about that one really hard that there's some. Does it cause problems that there's always two values for any given probability? I mean, I guess there's one value for exactly one and one value for exactly zero, but it's the unit circle. You could have gone either way. So yep. if rotating 15 degrees clockwise is going to matter which side of the circle I'm on because they're sort of inverse copies of the world. Yep, that's right. And advanced quantum algorithms take advantage of those weird angles. And moreover, um, the state of a set of qubits can't be described simply as the set of their individual two-bit superpositions. It's actually a full-blown matrix because the quantum bits can become entangled and the c naught gate in fact performs such an entanglement. So if you have n qubits, the state of the system is actually described by a um, two to the n by two to the n density matrix whose entries are complex numbers. And uh, wow. when you are, if you, if you are actually looking at the overall quantum state, uh, if you single out two qubits to operate on, for example, to do a conditional knot, you've got four other bits off on the side, say, so it's really a six qubit system. Then the way this is really described is in terms of um, 
tensor products that um, take the two qubit operator and project it into the six qubit density matrix space. In effect, by making lots of copies of it uh, through, the, through, the, through the magic of uh, tensor products. And uh, if you squint a little bit, it begins to look an awful lot like the APL language. In fact, I think, I wish I could, could get more quantum physicists to learn a little bit of APL because it might help them to structure their mathematics a little more carefully. I mean, basically everything they're doing is tensor multiplication. So APL seems like a pretty good language for multiplying matrices. Yes, but the, so, stand, the standard notation of tensor mathematics is good enough, but it's awkward in some ways that, that APL would make it a little smoother. So the real question is, if we're living in a simulation, can we prove it by using quantum computers to run the simulation out of RAM? <laughs> Yeah, I missed the last. I could hear everything. Depends if it's a classical ah. simulation or a quantum simulation. So, so that would Cameron, only prove that you are on a classical computer that was simulating the universe. Yeah. Cameron was asking, could we prove that we're in a living in a simulation or not living in a simulation by running the simulation out of RAM by quantum computing? Yeah. So it, it really feels like we're we're in about the nineteen fifties of quantum computing. Right. Yeah, it's right. really exciting when we reach like the 1970s and begin to see, you know, like actually really interesting programming languages. Yeah. Small talk Q. Yeah. Right. And it's still an open question. You know, we're learning how to pro build com quantum computers and, and, and we are beginning to build tools for programming them. But it's not clear exactly what is the space of interesting algorithms that we can usefully run cost-effectively on a quantum computer that that a much faster um, a classical computer wouldn't be good enough for. I mean, I can think of some good use cases of Shor's algorithm, yeah, and so can Shor's the NSA. Algorithm. We know Shor's algorithm. We hope that we will be able to use uh, quantum computers to crack classical encryption and therefore uh, make quantum uh, cryptography mandatory. But otherwise, I'm really not quite sure what the applications areas are going to be. Traveling salesman problem. Yeah, traveling salesman's problem, perhaps. All in Although physics seems remarkably defensive of its traveling salesman problem because you can't solve it perfectly, but you can get pretty close, close to the solution yeah, using true. approximations. Yeah, yeah. And, and the quantum enough. computer yeah. can solve it perfectly, but because of the statistical properties, it may or may not give you an answer. So it turns out your chances of it giving you a good answer comes out about the same as the chances of your approximating a good answer using approximate algorithms. I thought the approximate algorithm makes you wonder if there's something very fundamental going on there of the ways in which the universe protects against exponential uh, things. Maybe. So that's a good point. And a separate point is that even if it were guaranteed 100% to give you the perfect answer, the next question is at what cost and would we have been better off using a much cheaper computer to get the almost right solution? Right. Right. And that depends on at quantum. what cost. Yeah. Are quantum machines not deterministic? Do you, I mean, is physics deterministic? It depends on your interpretation of uh, quantum mechanics. Well, do you like the Copenhagen like School or do you like Everettian? So I, quantum I think computers. It's... Quantum computers are both deterministic and indeterministic at the same time. I mean, it's yeah. I think it's hard to say because the uh, because the computations are not perfectly accurate. There's a margin of error, and I think because of that, by definition, they will not be deterministic, right? Because that margin of error can change subtly, and from my limited understanding, that's the sort of current. Well, there's Sounds two problems. I think first we haven't actually developed a like true quantum computer. It's like close, but not quiet as far as I understand and then second the problem is that the um, the time and effort spent to verify that the computation is correct is uh, quite significant uh, to the point where I think what Guy said that the the applications are very questionable in, in its current state because of that sounds tough to debug as well it was going to also be true in the 1950s for using a computer versus just having somebody go whip out pencil and paper and beat it down.
I mean, they did that with the Apollo missions. They did using the computer, the entire flight mechanics, and they did it again using the pools of, uh, I guess the word's also computer, but those were humans. Yeah, the human computers. Yeah, yeah. There's a job for you. Oh. Didn't Turing end up marrying one of the computers? Oh, gosh. I'm remembering a, a Feynman story with grad students and a, a row of computers, and they were trying to do atomic bomb simulations. And they had issues with bugs that somebody had made where they cross check had failed and they figured out but the computation had moved on so they decided to follow that computation with another one to do the correction that was introduced by the bug so they had pipelines at one point of three different bugs chasing through the rows of women doing math computations to fix bugs from the prior that you know, had escaped the the cross check it was a fun story i'd rather years? do fortran with an ibm 360 guy pardon you said something oh i was going to ask whether any of you have seen the movie hidden figures when it came out or since then oh no um mm -hmm. which is about these uh these uh female computers working for nasa and in particular about katherine johnson and oh Eva. right and uh i thought it was a good movie uh they took some liberties but i thought it did a pretty good job for for the lay audience of giving a feel for what that environment would have felt like uh, both socially and computationally. You know, there, there were, you know, uh, for example, rooms in which they worked that had huge blackboards. They could, you know, communicate with each other. La blackboards so large you had to climb up ladders right at the top of them. And uh, slide rules and things like that. And uh, there was one scene uh, where um, one of the female protagonists uh, sneaks into a computer room of the time. And I, I looked at it uh, with great curiosity. I thought they did a beautiful job of portraying that computer room. And I noticed just one glaring exception. It took me a while to realize what it was and, and that they had done it for a good dramatic purpose, which is that she's in the computer room and it's busy. Um, she feeds it some cards and it proceeds to print out some stuff on a printer. It was a 1403 printer and I realized that the sound of the movie did not contain the screech of the 1403 printer. And I think that was a good dramatic decision because it would have detracted from the feeling of the scene. Oh, okay. I live with but those computers you ever found jobs the, flip, the flip of the cards to the card reader, all that stuff, the blinky lights on the console were accurate. You know, that, that part was great. But the, the particular printer noise, I remember that. I, I worked with those. Yeah. It had a distinctive, you know, very annoying screechy sound. And anyone who's not familiar with that sound watching would say, what's that? You know, what's going on? Oh, Again, yeah, right. So. Well, I definitely remember hearing the audio patterns when I was printing postal cards for the blood center that had people's addresses and time to donate blood again. And it would change tone as it printed the line of the name, the line of the address, the city state zip. And you could hear the different tones and know where you were going. Yeah. You could talk a lot about what a computer was doing in the 60s and 70s by listening. Yeah. And the watching yeah. lights on the console. And uh, I also uh, used a trick that I picked up from someone else. I forget where I read it. But I just took my uh, Radio Shack six transistor radio, right, right, and stuck it just stuck it on top of the blinky lights of the IBM eleven thirty. And, and did you make it make music out of it? Uh, I used it to make music, but also I could just tell what was going on inside the computer. Yeah, fine. Yeah, better yeah. by, by listening to the sounds because th that machine had a clock rate of about um, um, hundred kilohertz. Yeah, and so. Yeah. It, you know, if registers were not being uh, cranked every instruction, then the registers were being cranked in the uh, in the range of milliseconds to tens of milliseconds, and those are audio frequencies. Right, right. Yeah. I, There's I, definitely something lost in getting separated from the hardware. I uh, worked for a while at a company that had two large data centers and was having a conversation just over lunch because I happened to be at the cafeteria at the same time with someone who was doing data center operations. And they asked me if I knew why a particular aisle in the data center sounded so different than all of the other aisles. Hmm. 
And it turns out that one aisle was the cold storage system. So the disks would spin up and do a little bit of work and then spin down. And uh. it was essentially doing no CPU. And we realized that we actually had a large amount of idle resources and made some tweaks to the scheduler so that it would put the cold storage sort of spread throughout the data center instead of all in one spot, which reduced the amount of heat on all of the other racks. And by changing the system so that it spread cold storage in between things that were doing very hot compute so that it could be a thermal buffer, we got a lot more energy out of that. It wouldn't have occurred to anyone to do that except for the fact that someone who worked in the data center said, hey, have you noticed this one aisle sounds different than all of the other aisles? If we had been in the cloud, we never would have noticed that or seen that inefficient. Like there is something lost when you get farther from the hardware. Great story. Thank you. There reminds me of a video I saw at some point. Uh, I'll see if I can dig it up in a bit. But it's about um, two people, I believe, in a data center. And they found out that if you scream at the hard drive... Um, I believe it like briefly slows down the computer or like in the, or that I think it's in the task manager or whatever, in some graph goes up uh, if you scream at the hard drives. And this is in spite of them already being in your know, very loud uh, data center environment. Cause the acoustic vibration and the head wouldn't settle. I'm guessing. Uh, let me see if the I can find yeah, it. It's all air pressure waves. Yeah, it's, it's like a video with Brian Kentrell and Brendan Gregg. So they're in the data center and uh, like they're looking at like disk latency and D-trace or something. And uh, yeah, the, the video is in there. In the, in chat. Put, it in the, put it in the chat. I'll have to look at it. I don't want to look at it now. So and, what, screaming on a hard what, drive. and what was hilarious is, you know, the Winchester effect was like uh, this term in the industry that was well known. So someone was brilliant and they actually started a company called Winchester selling hard drives. I thought that was... <laughs> I assumed it was the Winchester dude who did the original work. I have no idea. I don't think so, but it, I, I don't know. I was very young at the time. Okay. Well, yeah, me too. <laughs> I, maybe not born. <laughs> Somewhere in high school, I had disk drives that were the size of washing machines that I dealt with. And they would definitely have heads that were pounds that were... <laughs> You're me doing my sound effects again here. Shake the whole thing. Yeah, it could be. All right, guy, what else? Guy, guy is like, you kids with your disk drives. <laughs> it's 2.30 and I need to go now, but thanks. It's been fun talking with you. It's been a lot of fun having you. Thank guys. you. Yeah, thanks, yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. I do sometimes wonder about the alternate reality where instead of having JavaScript and making everyone move it over by one, they had just shipped the version with Scheme in it. I have an alternate reality version of Intel didn't win the day. We had some amount of choices of computer hardware. Actually, that, that, that I would like to just mention one more thing about like, what Levo said about not wanting to have users write multi-threaded code. I think there's just like one maybe sad thing, I feel like uh, that's like this incentive problem uh, of technology like, that has uh, that, that gives you like, huge increases in productivity, uh, like specifically software. Like it has this problem of like when you are at a lower level, like maybe you want to innovate and then you build things on top and you build things more and more on top. And the problem is that uh, the higher you go, the more people kind of get involved and the more things get produced. So like the momentum kind of uh, like gets worse and worse at the top. So that may, it makes changing things at the lower level more difficult. And it also means that less time is invested in either innovating or improving things at that level. So like, I mean, if you, yeah, like we, we, if we were writing or creating lots of languages that abstract all of these things like multi-threading away from the user, then we also have less people who at, at, in, in one, on the one hand know how to write multi-threaded code or like yeah. deal with hardware, but also we will have less people just generally writing programming languages that accommodate the needs of the people who implement the runtimes, the operating systems. And I guess if you go look at the, the tooling that people have to deal with who work in the embedded space or the, like the hardware engineering space, 
like their tooling is horrible and ancient and there are no software people who are in, like or not enough people who are actually working in this space because they don't feel the same pain so i mean yeah and uh right maybe maybe just a, a bigger chunk of of people should uh aspire to be the next cliff uh or whatever just uh you know like some things are hard uh, just you know maybe you have more people uh like just yeah i don't know like, i got a controversial to deal with it. you guys yeah. want to hear that well i want to add on to adrian and then we'll hear your controversy so the, the same layering effect goes with hardware has a split from software um, and it, you know, and then on the software layer for the OS split from user apps like a JVM, which then has a layer. Um, and so the innovation below a layer goes slower or faster, but there's definitely some efforts that make it innovate and there's your money involved at Intel side to innovate. You get to the OS and the Linux kernel's busy innovating still, but they drew a hard line that says, we don't know what happens at user space and we're gonna be perfect from the user's point of view. Um, and then the JVM piled on and said, hey, and I build up and you might as well say Python or anyone else's runtime, but they draw a hard line at some point and say, okay, apps at the JVM plus plus or Python plus plus layer can rely on below and the lines kind of become fixed and those lines do get difficult to change without having great effort and the where they land later in life becomes maybe a problem that you'd rather have seen a different split between things you know the famous hardware software co-design and the embedded folks are kind of in it so there's definitely innovations if you can cross those lines but they're hard to cross because there's a pile of experts on one end and a pile of experts on the other end, but there's not a pile of experts right on the line that are crossing it themselves. So I don't have any solution for this. I'm just observing this is the economics of the world right now. You yeah, draw yeah, more than like, one line at the, at the different layers. Right, it's basically <clears> like, <throat> it's basically a network effect. Like this is uh, yeah something you can complain about, but it's really, really difficult to change. I mean, yeah. Yeah, when you drive a car, and you're on the road, the road layouts have been slowly improved for 50 years, and they now have very strong rules about sight lines and visibility of the radius of the turn, of how fast water drains in a rainstorm, of crowning the road for that, of maintenance and things you do. And that is because cars have been built to match the road, the roads have been built to match the car. There is a hard line between the definitions of those two pieces, but that didn't have to be that way. That line could be a different place. Certainly, if you get on a racetrack, the road is built difficult to drive on purpose um and, and you re suddenly realize all the things that a standard you know road engineer thinks about but if our cars looked substantially different you could imagine a substantially different road like railroads they're, they're a different kind of a road so i don't know so the, these lines happen in life all over the place and looking across the lines is where you find the largest place for innovations and gains because it's the fewest number of people, I guess, staring at both sides and trying to figure out where we could do better. All right, done. All right, so um, there's always gonna be people who will want to know how the hardware works and what it actually does. So there's always gonna be, be people who's writing the low level code and uh, the multi-threading and all that. But uh, my controversial opinion is that when people ask what's uh, what's the complexity of the algorithms? It's just nonsense, like absolute nonsense. Because every time you call anyone's code, you have no idea if it does a memory allocation or it does a split. So all that goes out the window unless you're writing low-level code and no one writes low-level code because otherwise I wouldn't have to do it all myself. <laughs> you're talking about the cost model. As yeah, soon as you, yeah. As soon as you step away from the hardware, I mean, you're costing on the hardware. What's the well, cost people model always, of a Java People program? always want to abstract things away, but they also want you to know the cost of things. But that's impossible to know. Or... I don't think it's impossible. I think there have been yeah. times when it's been removed. There are times when it's still available. There are times you have to think about it, but there's not been a lot of effort to keep it around, except for experts who want to do something fast on purpose. So if I call a JSON library, there's no way for me to know how complex it is. Like, is yeah. it, that's like that if you story. have to call it at the library level and all you know is it's a library, you lost the necessary information. Yeah. 
that's like 90% of, or 98% of the code. I'm just I saying, no how low, if I go right, low. a big data machine learning algo, and I'm trying to pump memory through for data processing for execution speed, I'm very performance sensitive. I know how to get that information and how to write that code, but I didn't grab a random JSON library. I grabbed yes. some random Java libraries, but they were never in my critical performance path. So one answer was I didn't call a library when I wanted performance code. Yeah, and that's why I try not to take any dependencies. So I, I just always thought it was weird that everyone asks what's the complexity of things, yeah. but everyone also abstracts things away. So it made well, no the, sense Well, the common slowdown for calling a random library isn't algorithmic generally, but it might be tenfold or 100-fold more expensive as a constant factor than you'd expect or need. But people, I don't think they generally blow the asymptotic times hugely. But this rises the question: Why high. would you? This rises the question: Why would you? Uh, why would you import a library at the first time uh, in the first place? Oh, because so in my opinion, it could just. So in my the problem opinion, it could just be any code that you never written yourself, so you don't the, know what it's actually doing. Yeah, you, you don't have any typing the, system theory on what the cost model is. The problem here is that you want to import the functionality because you want to move on and come back maybe later. Yeah. Right. So right. so the problem is that there needs to be a boundary that you can still call the library, but you can abstract it away later. So, so there needs to be an interface boundary or something, something that you can remove later in order to be more specific with your implementation, think, which is not. I think most data so, structure libraries are now simple enough. We know how to swap linked list for array list. Okay, and, but and the library it, doesn't the library doesn't allow you that in the most cases there you you have a go ahead. Uh, yeah I'm saying in, in the land of Java if you just use the list and you carried on and you implemented a link and later on somebody smacked you around you switch it to array list you probably got a performance gain you walked away. You used a hash map and later somebody said, oh, I had to lock it because multi-threading and then you went to concurrent hash map or non-blocking, you got a performance gain by swapping the library at the library layer. Those are sort of well-defined library tooling lets you get away with those kind of things. By, by setting a boundary between the, the list interface, that's fine, but you, you, you probably don't have a boundary around libraries. The functionality that sits is behind is in front of interface that, and you import the library just to get the functionality in order to move on and then you swap that implementation you with say something. you probably don't have a, a, a an interface you mean not java which has these interfaces for libraries no i i use the term as a boundary between okay. that you, you you don't allow the library to permeate to 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 leak into your code because that's way it, it becomes impossible to or very hard to to remove later on Let's you, it gives you a spot where you can slice and dice and separate. Yeah. The, the issues but I have I... with cost models is that they're not part of the language typing system. So I can't reason about how costly something is by looking at its type signature. Hmm. And then these factors of tenfold or hundredfold, which I mentioned earlier, are common and they happen and they're actually big enough that I care. So I would really would like that there'd be some interesting cost model information thrown in a typing system, but I don't know how to do that. So, so you should, do, uh, what are you saying? Is there maybe you import a library, which maybe you don't have the source code implementation on, but you can ask the question, yeah. what are your performance characteristics? Well, I will say I'm going to require uh, uh, 10 megs of RAM and I'm going to touch 100 cache lines every time you call me, and I'll be linear in the number of times you call me, or something like that. I don't, I don't know how to express time here because clock cycles and tiny embedded versus my, you know, thousand dollar, ten thousand dollar desktop machine, whatever the the hash line yeah, promises is interesting. That, that sounds really utopian. Like, has that been done? Like expressing some, something in such cache a degree? Line in, in, in... No, no, no. I no, prefer no. just Sorry. trust the per profiler. Well, more mistakes for you. Uh, well, we'll, think, we'll talk about that in a minute. But has it been done like that you include like performance characteristics to this detail in, in, inside the type system? Like, I've been wanting to for a long time. If you switch to a hardware, they'll make you count cycles. 
Um, but it's it's a little it's a little coarse grain in that sense and a little too fine grain. It's not the right granularity for what I would say comp sci. But I could imagine a model. I've seen people try this attempt where they count effort done on the different control flow paths and unify them, especially for like memory allocation. There is an obvious performance gain to be made by saying in this pile of code that has no loops, but has a lot of branchy control flow, I can find the sum of all total memory allocations needed. Um, and it'll be the max on all paths. And I'll just pre-allocate that. And then I won't do any other allocation, no matter what path you take through here. Now, if this is all wrapped in a loop, well, I need one of these for the loop. And suddenly this memory stays co-resident in my cache with the running the loop. And I quit doing any cache misses while it's running. And you know, after the loop starts, it's no more cache misses and fuck, it's fast. So that a bunch of early C implementations time. basically did that with calls that it allocated every variable that could possibly be instantiated in yeah. one call stack move, and then it freed it all. Right, right. The, this it is never one moved of the, the frame in the middle of a function. This is one of the optimizing compiler, you know, theories of performance gains over interpreters or over a lot of other things. C two certainly does that. One one frame after, plus all is inlines after. I, you know, hit it with the register allocator to clean up the duplications and all that. And you get a tiny, tiny stack frame for allocation, relatively speaking. C2 frames are always smaller than their interpreter counterparts, generally by a lot. And that's part of the performance gain, too, is you don't eat so much memory. <laughs> yes, this is Matt's writing in chat here, basically. I, I talked about this like a decade ago in front of people in keynotes. It's not about how much instructions you execute. It's how many cache lines you touch. Go count cache lines. But I don't have an answer that says, here's how I count cache lines. We shall see comes around in, in ecstasy because the goal is to have, one of the goals is to have a harder, tighter constraint on memory that you're going to consume and uh, maybe we can't tell ahead of time how much, but we can put a cap and say, you'll be less than this or we're going to kill you. But less than this means that you had to be recycling the memory at a reasonable rate. And that meant that it might have a chance of being cash co-resident and you might get some performance out of that. But we're not going to use that as a marketing slogan. Use less than this or we're going to kill you. Yeah, what? Oh, come on. My anyway, marketing I, skills, they're right up there with my sound Foley skills. <laughs> yeah, Foley consultant. No, but uh, uh, Matt linked a really good, uh, a very interesting uh, link, uh, resource aware, aware ML. So it's like OCaml, okay, but yeah. you can put uh, like constraints or, or just bounds on, on allocated heap cells and apparently user-defined ticks. ticks. Yeah, so, so gas, gas for the... Um... Well, the blockchain folks want to run smart contracts that give you gas, funny money cycles. Yeah, we, we call right it. Now, killed. Yeah. yeah, we call it. I work for uh, maybe a, whatever. Like we call it cycles. Uh, Ethereum yeah. calls it gas, but we're we're uh, cooler. No, it sounds good. I think mean, ecstasy is going to make some effort along those uh, fronts as well. Okay, but here's the about source code. Where's the where's the efficient the... is ecstasy? Because I thought it was going to be a little bit of slower than Java, but not that much slower. Well, it's as efficient as every language is. Efficiency is not part of the language spec, so it's unrelated. It's the effort of implementation. That's how efficient it is. What to count is always an interesting question. The Facebook team that did their uh, custom key value store with RocksDB. Yeah. They do all of their measurement on disk seeks. Oh, okay. Because basically they're doing a giant key value store that doesn't fit in the flash part of the system. Oh. And as far as their cost model is concerned, flash reads were free. Disk seeks were the entire cost model. Like right. to some extent, it sense. just depends what you're doing. Yeah. 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 Totally makes sense. So Levo, at the moment, I'm busy trying to get XTC to run on a JVM, which will do something about the execution costs and do nothing about disk costs. Might do something about heap consumption at some future date, but that'll be a big pile of work to be done on top of other things. And the, the early signs are nice. Cliff had a, uh, a demo this week that was roughly two orders of magnitude better than the uh, proof of concept we did. 
Now, that wasn't too hard, though. No. There's a lot more hard stuff to go do yet. Yep. Well, yeah, hmm. thank you. No, that's very cool. Very exciting. So I had a moment like that when I first started working on persistent data structures. And this other developer that I was working with was like, oh my God, we can't do this thing in a hash mat. It's just, it's seven times slower than it needs to be to even be feasible. And we sat down with the profiler and looked for exactly where all the misses were. And in two days, got it to be 700 times faster. Oh, nice. Whoa. And it was like, well, what was the experience? You wrote all of this system without ever profiling or measuring any piece of it. Like, yes. It turns out things that no one has put any effort into optimizing have some low hanging fruit. And I think that's most of our society. Twitter hit a point in 2020 when, for some reason, they couldn't buy any CPUs. So they were like, oh, drat, our traffic is growing, our compute resources are finite, and suddenly the entire company shifted from this model of buying more computers is cheaper than hiring more engineers to there are no more CPUs available, find ways to do this more efficiently. Yeah, and at the and time they had the performance 500... games were just amazing because there were all kinds of systems that literally no one had ever run a profile. Yeah, on. They had five hundred thousand servers at the time to run Twitter, which yeah. it's a but, pretty large number. Alan was going to say something, but he's so quiet that no one realized he was saying anything. So Alan, speak up. Well, oh, well, I just, I mean, so like Levo showed off his editor, and he was like, "I did it in a week," and so like. I forget whether he, I, I don't think he actually challenged me, but I set myself the challenge to make an editor in a week. Um, so I wanted to show it off if anyone's. Absolutely. Interested. Yep. So, Far away. So the Alan I still don't believe it's her, I think. Oh, uh, seeing is believing. Bring it on. Bring it on. Yeah, we want, we want Alan Computer to introduce himself. Yeah, let me see if it works. Um, all right. I, I've never seen Alan write a single line of code since I've been here. <laughs> yeah okay so this is yes good it seems to be working um so you can see i got like emoji support down here um yeah i didn't have time for like arabic or uh roll down some more is it actually an editor can you edit no it, it, it's it's just a viewer it's not an editor <laughs> i didn't i didn't go that far syntax highlighting print balancing yeah. So, like, what I was all right. Um, and bit, bit, oh, more, more text. Scrolls. Page down a few times. Well, I'm trying to. Okay, I think I have to share my screen. You did. Than, well, no. See, the problem is there's this green border which I don't want, and so I'm going to try to. Oh, get I don't know where that came from. I, I mean, yeah. most people who share don't get a green border. Well, there you go. So there, that's better. Yeah, um, I can see the closing okay. curlies now. Yeah, and so like the thing about it is it's a proportional font because I wanted to mess around with using proportional fonts. Oh, and so sure you can enough. see like right here, like this, if in a monospace font, it would be lined up. Yeah, so right. No, no, I see. It's a proportional font. Yeah. Okay, page down a few times. I want to see how fast your page fresh is here. Well, I mean, it's as fast as I can do my scroll wheel. It's oh, using that's fine. That, it's that using a... OpenGL, so it's actually pretty fast. Um, yeah. Okay. But so so I so I what I was messing with was using OpenGL does not necessarily lead to being fast. I mean, like I, I could. I mean, this is basically the code. It's it's a little more complicated, but like, it looks it's... looks fast enough to be usable. And you're not editing, obviously, just drawing. But it's fast to be usable. All right, Levo, there you go. He yeah, wrote no, some code. So, so... Okay, so I, I didn't show what I actually implemented. This is actually someone else's code. Like they were... <laughs> <laughs> I've been trolled. So um yeah, that so what be. I implemented was like a different uh, layout algorithm. So if you uh hit so like wait so no did... no 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 I'm not gonna believe you now. No no so this I did write. I literally cried, wrote this cried wrote wolf this. here. So what I did was I made this algorithm that like detects all the columns that would show up in a monospace font and then it lines them up in the proportional font so you can see now like this is lined up and, uh, and like what, what know, is declared to be a column 
And so, so, so like every column in a monospace font, it's like the it's after a space. So like, if you have a so here uh, there's a space. And then so like you're the only monospace before start. the first visible character. Yeah, no. and so then I line it up to the same column it would be lined up with in a monospace font. He, he's um, saying every time there's a space in the text, every space where it is in the line gets what width added until it aligns with the equivalent mono space. Or or could. He he right. could. That's the yeah. Right. So no. like you, okay. you should imagine it as a giant table and then like each uh each it's like each columns uh each column spans some number of cells. That's like right. the number of characters in right. the cell. Right. You counted so, characters and multiplied by font width and added spacing when you found a space. Yeah. And so then like uh, and so then like I was like this still has all these weird spaces cuz it's a global layout. Right. <laughs> so I wrote okay, I said okay, I'll do that but I'll do a local layout. I'll make a little miniature table for like each line so it lines up with the tables above and below of it. Um and so that's Are you doing app. it for the whole file or only what's currently on screen? Um it's the whole file. It's actually possible to split it up because it stops at at blank lines. So like mm. this this line, because it doesn't have anything on it, you could just stop the algorithm there and like break it into pieces. But I'm yeah, so other, so this other. is the third this is the third view you're showing right now, right? Yeah, so go back to the first. Go back to the first so people can see what you did. So yeah, first, so this is the first, second, second, and, and third, and third. Yeah. Cool. I can see it. Yeah. 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 And third so, is like, definitely better than second. Levo's yeah. way behind so, now because like, he doesn't have like, he doesn't have the columns done or the Unicode. You can see like it's there's still some weird spaces like here with the Unicode. It kind of I think it's lining up the S and the the star here, and I don't yeah. know what it's lining up this text with. <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe the emoji. Um. But like, you know, it's pretty good. Like, I mean, uh, uh, there's, yeah, and here, like this space, I was like, I, I don't know how to get rid of it. <laughs> I think you need like machine learning or something because it is like a clear Wait, amount lining You're up. in a comment. Although I'll, I I do make block structured comments that align headers over blocks of code where I want to do a rectangularly shaped piece of Yeah, code. I put tables of values in comments more often than I care to admit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then there's like this one, the, ant, the ampersand lines up with closed parentheses. I mean, yeah. That's, that's just no, the coding. I, given that algorithm in front of me and I was editing the code, I might add spaces in other places to get a better layout on a individual line basis. Yeah. But like sure. here, you know, here, like it lines them up just perfectly. Like that is, you know, that's what yeah. you want. Yeah. They, they lined up the spaces and the spaces are lined up. See? No, it looks good. Yeah. So, um, and similarly here, and and so yeah, like I'm places, it works really well. And places, it's kind of eh. yeah, interesting. So, I don't know. I'll just go through the whole file. No, no, no. I, I'm I'm with you. Like your hand delay to Caro to render has a bunch of types spacing to line up the glyph count and glyph info although i would use the star and space over the word glyph so all your word glyphs glyph count glyph info glyph pause all align and then your equals for assignments align that's you know pretty close to what i would hand do yeah but like i mean it i mean when it works it works really well and like it doesn't have too many false positives but it does have some false positives so a Perl editor? What is, I'm missing something in the chat that I probably should not be reading. No, I think he has it backwards because a Perl editor is write only. So you don't need a viewer. Oh, <laughs> isn't that like cat dash pipe greater to a file and then you just type it in? Yeah, so this project is like example SDL free type Cairo renderer or something. It's on GitHub if you look for it. Um, it's it's not actually the code I'm using. <laughs> I just like I, I tried this one first and it ended up being in the root of my repository, so I used it first. Uh, so. So your font has colors, but you're not colorizing the text yet. No, no. So so that this is actually two fonts. 
Um, right, so emoji. the main yeah. font is Noto Sans. Um, and then this emoji font is like some emoji font from the web. So, Noto Sans from the Android open source project. Yeah, well, from Google. I mean, they distribute it a number of ways, but. Hmm. but it's actually the default font in KDE. So, so who's who's the guest next week for com for the coffee editor club? <laughs> um, it'll be a blank screen, so you won't be able to know. We missed All the right. chance of uh, asking about Emacs. Be, be the he, yeah, well, clearly guy still uses Emacs, so there you go. All the best programmers use Emacs. Which is obvious. He, he he created it. I didn't think, I thought, he thought uh, did he? Harold. He and Harold Sussman, right? Yeah, I thought, okay. I thought it was somebody else. And then, well, what did Guy, what did Stallman yeah, I steal? I didn't know that. Tico. Was it written in Scheme? Well, I had a lisp inside of it. I just, I don't think it was written in Scheme. No, Scheme uh, came 20 years later, I thought. No, he was uh, I, 77. I think he was still at MIT at 77. And he, I thought it was him and Harold. Give me a second. Uh, I looked up uh, the source code online. I don't know if it was their source code, but um, it had C and uh, Lisp. Yeah, not Scheme, but a Lisp, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the Lisp that's in Emacs David, is just Emacs David Lisp. Moore. It's its own variant. Well, at this point, yeah. But I mean, it's a basic, it's not common Lisp, but it's a basic precursor to like common Lisp. Yeah. Like, I always cut and paste and then modify a little bit. I'm not an expert on ELIS, but I, I know enough to get by. Yeah, I was like, I think I told Cameron, mm. or maybe it was the main mm. channel, that I can get a. But like, it, and uh, Steel there. Okay. I remember when I, can... I talked with him once because back in grad school, we had a Symbolics machine and he was around because Symbolics was a company thing, trying to do a thing. I was using the Symbolics machine. I heard they were unbelievably slow. Yes. It was for a, this was this project the Navy was trying to get a bunch of people to work on for a small, I don't want to talk about it more. Um, basically, I, I backwards engineered what the hell they were doing as a doomsday bomb. And I, I, I voted out of the project after a while. I was in it long enough to decide I was making a doomsday bomb and I got out. And I got to use a Symbolics machine along the way and it wasn't terribly fast. But that's part uh, of your just, story also was that Azul was very symbolic inspired and was like, we're going to build a machine that runs the JVM bytecode directly. And then everyone was like, no, 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 JIT, oh, JIT target. No, you want no. a JIT target. You don't want to actually do JVM the, in the hardware. The CEO is a, was a 3D FX CEO. So he knew how to make compu uh, uh, computer CPUs in large parallel arrays for graphics cards. He thought we can make one that'll run Java threads in large parallel arrays, just like graphics. That was the original inspiration. Then the hardware team they hired, which was a bunch of you know graphics guys that can do CPU design for graphics CPUs, were like, what can we do to speed up Java? Well, let's do all these Java basic direct execution things. And then I showed up and was like, dudes, no. Give me a fucking nice risk to go code to and uh, everything else can be done in software. And so we had a bunch of conversations. They had a lot of Kind of interesting, weird hacks that were kind of cool, but they had software solutions that were much better. So, oh, I see Adrian's going to write me a hex editor. There you go. Uh, so, why do you think they couldn't keep up with Intel producing faster and faster CPUs? Because it costs a butt ton of money to do the engineering to get a faster CPU. So, the the first generation, they bought a lot of pre made IP, they called it, um, for CPU design layout. For how to do registers, how to do uh, ad, ad, adders and addressing the X links for cross off chip communication for memory buses, all that kind of stuff. Most of the things they bought had stated, well, the all things they bought had stated frequencies they would execute at. And you had to go do the layout yourself and line up bits and parts and whatever. And most of them lied through their teeth and were actually good for about half of their stated frequencies, which meant that the ultimate frequencies we could get out of the chip were you way the hell down and there were lots of complaints go back and forth and some of them updated and gave us newer better versions that they were trying to sell to even higher rates but were actually at the stated rates of the last generation yada 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 took a long time to get the first chip out and had a lot of issues because the most of the ip that we bought actually was 
it was widespread known in the industry, but it was a big fail. Um, similar with the heart with uh, power supplies. You bought a bunch of power supplies that would be rated at 2,500 watts. And then the hardware guy put a 2,500 watt load across it and fire it up and it would just melt. You know, the power supply would just blow up immediately. Makes me wonder if you could play the same game with Risk Five and totally open source hardware implementations from top to bottom and do better if you tried it today. Um, well, today, you know, there might be a different thing. Yeah, right, right. I don't know. That's a good point. I think ARM also opened up a lot of their stuff that was not available to us at that time either. So there might have been a couple of choices of what to do about a basic CPU. Now, we had some things we did different that that I would want to have seen in hardware. The, the cache line zero operation, no one's duplicated it and everyone else gets it wrong. And then you don't get the benefit out of the cache line zero unless you get all certain subtle hacks right. Um, we had operations for doing uh, like array addressing modes that would scale with the proper math x86 default sign extend add addressing mode gets the sign extension in the wrong place so you have to also have a sign extension to do 64-bit math there um what's cache line like, zero what did you what did, what was that um okay so so a lot of chips have a cache line zero that zeros put zeros in your cache is an effort to avoid reading memory if you're a jvm if you look at the where the where your bandwidth goes Every time you do a bump pointer allocation, it's one clock to bump. You get a new cache line that's never been in your CPU caches since the last GC cycle. So statistically speaking, it's almost surely a hard cache miss. So every every time you allocate an object, you pay one clock to get that me virtual memory address. You pay a full cache miss to get the contents. That streams in, it streams out, and it pushes shit out of your caches. And you're constantly flushing your caches in a JVM, any bump pointer allocated language. It's a well-known problem. I teach class on this. There's like giant gains to be had, giant gains, large integer factor, 5x speed ups for doing recycling memory instead of bump pointer allocation constantly. Okay, fine. So uh, a cache line zero um, has to go get coherent with the rest of the cluster at some point so that everyone else agrees that you've zeroed the line. To be effective here, you want to prefetch the zeros so you have time to go get the line zeroed in your L1 and make sure everyone else has flushed that line. Now, statistically speaking, they probably don't have that line, but they have to be, they have to tell you, the other course have to tell you they don't have a copy of the line, so you have exclusive access so you can begin scribbling in it. Um, you, as a prefetch, it happens before the use site, and if a lock comes in between, you don't want the lock to force synchronization on the, the cache line zero you just emitted. So you basically told the system as a whole, write 32 bytes of zeros or 64, your cache line has bytes of zeros out. That if you do a typical lock in Java, that write has to be cache coherent before the lock allows you to proceed. You, you put a storage store barrier or load low barrier in the right places and you, you block. That means that you lose the, the benefit of the prefetch because you're blocked immediately. So if you allocate and lock and allocate and unlock and allocate and lock and allocate and unlock, you're constantly blocking on the lock for the prefetch and it didn't actually prefetch. So you want the cache line zero to be in a different memory coherency domain than the rest of the memory system. That's a subtle bit that no one else gets right. Then you prefetch it. And then you, you, you know, some number of clock cycles later, you're counting in cache lines, some number of cache lines later, you're out of pre-zeroed cache lines and you now start using one you just prefetched and you write into it. And at that time- And this is all to deal with the fact that the free space that is past the end of your bump allocator is don't cares, but the CPU doesn't have a concept of don't care. Yes. So so the, the point of the zero here is I, I'm marching it along and I'm feeling behind, but the zeros wants to be ahead, the start of the zeros. And then they're, they, they don't roll in zeros. They just fill the line immediately and then put the minus invalid or, or empty, whatever. You want it to be hard set to uh, uh, owned so you can modify it. So you have to wait for the reply from the other CPUs that they don't own that line anymore. So you emit the prefetch. The CPU goes ahead and zeros the line, puts it down as invalid. Uh, it might have to, if you've got co collisions, you might have to begin writing. So he emits, he takes the current line, actually throws it in the store buffer and says it, it has to go out. I now fill it with zeros. Uh, I'll declare it invalid because it's not mutable yet. 
and I'm waiting for the reply. The reply comes back lazily, but you need an op that says at the time, now block the cache line zeros, just like a memory fence, but it's only for cache line zeros. So you need two classes of memory fences, one for cache line zeros, one for everybody else. And you actually want one for everybody else that covers all things, and you want everyone else for common things that you end up doing that don't that you typically don't need to block for, but you have to be careful about. So you want a few flavors. So load, 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 store. We did all four flavors of loads and store locking variations. Um, and you could pick and choose a little bit, uh, you know, to make life better. But but you had to have a separate one for cache line zero that you did right before you begin writing into it. If it was coherent in your caches already, that instruction should be, you know, one clock. And otherwise it stalls until it heard the last report back from whoever CPU was being targeted telling you. So, uh, and I don't know what the more recent ARM ones. I know IBM's DCVZ didn't do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Intel had a non-temporal store that didn't do the right thing. They had a couple of flavors. Um, I see Matt dumped the ARMS one. I'd have to stare at the, that's not cause an L1 allocation if it misses in the hierarchy. Writes zero directly to mean memory. That's not what you want. You don't want to burn memory bandwidth. You specifically want to write only to your L1. Um, you may write to your L2. You specifically don't want to write to memory because that takes bandwidth away from shared memory bandwidth. You're only going to write the final answer when the line gets evicted to main memory. So it wants to write to your L1, maybe your L2, not to memory. It wants to be in a different cache coherency domain than the other loads and store memory ops. You have to have a separate fencing for it then. And then after that, it's it's fine. All of the things like the prefetch thing. I asked the question, mm -hmm. how big was the cache line? I don't care how big you zero. I, be, I asked how big was the cache line zero? Now, having known that when I emitted code, I would have the bump pointer allocator guy add that many cache lines ahead that I thought I needed to prefetch against. So I was doing lazy just-in-time zeroing at a fixed number for however many cache lines ahead. Yeah, you're trying to eliminate one read and one write per cache line. I eliminated one of the 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 reads on a cache line. Well, and you, you every every volume of heap you've allocated, I failed to read it from memory. Every allocation, the typical x86, you allocate a gigabyte of memory over your course of your running your program, then you would read a, a gigabyte of memory in, and you would write a gigabyte of memory out because that flushed through your caches and you can't hold the gig. So it went back out. So you read a gig, write a gig for every gig that you allocate. In our case in Azul, you would only write the gig, not read it. And that had a measurable effect that we were using one third less memory bandwidth than a standard JVM on an x86. We could measure that number. Coupled with the right. fact that we had been without the wazoo, we, we could do all kinds of parallel massive computations. But, but in in a lot of systems today, you still do an extra read and an extra write because, for example, when you're freeing the memory, it's going to zero it, which forces the extra write. When you then, when, no in in a in a standard x86, when you run the cache out, something got written to memory, so the write happens. Now at the end of the GC cycle, and it's time to begin again. That memory didn't go back to another process, so it's typically not zero. It's left dirty and ran. You get one read and one write of main memory for every allocated byte, basically. Hmm. If you want to free the page, the OS wants to zero it to save security. If you want to allocate so the page. On ARM, this may be a different use case, but the typical use case for this instruction is memset. When you are writing to memory and you're just zeroing out, you do not want to allocate cache line for fields. So yeah. that's where this instruction is being used. Yeah, and that makes total sense. It's different from what you do in a bump pointer allocation, yes. And, and I think Azul didn't have a mem set that only did the write to memory. I know the Intel non-temporal store is one of those where you're just writing, you don't want to read it in, you know what it is. So you're moving it from a disk buffer to a memory or you're just zeroing. You could do the um, overall store. Maybe I misheard you, but you can uh, write to L1 and L2 cache without uh, touching mem uh, main memory. On uh, Intel, yeah. Well, all chips will write to L1 and L2. They get coherency from from the other guys. They may well. Okay, they may have read. They probably had to read it from main memory. Yeah, Azul did not read from main memory. 
That's the that was the point of the of the R zero instruction. Do not read the main memory. Okay, yeah, because I, I didn't know a way to do that with the Intel. Yeah, and the the if you fail to read from memory and the memory was important, then you lost it. So it's a user mode. It only crushed the user, but you can crush your memory if you did stupid things with it. So we just you know you you walk you you had a region you was dead it was the heap it was the fresh un, unused heap was the dead memory and so you could just zero without reading you could do the same thing in a malloc free implementation if you knew that what you're about to go zero was dead memory you have the pile of dead memory you're allocating from you don't you don't want, don't want to read it and as long as you own the memory and no one else touches it right. you don't really worry about memory coherence because the cache coherence is handling it right now once it comes into my cpu and somebody publishes an address to it it's immediately got to be cache coherent to the next core over who loads it in the next clock cycle and begins expecting to see valid bits. Just trying to remember, I think 10, 15 years ago, Intel added an instruction to enable you to declare certain chunks of memory scratch space that would never go further than L3. They oh, were like, I want this to be in my CPU. I don't ever want to write this out to memory. This is right. just... Right. Most of your, like, your stack would be dead but i haven't heard anything about that in like over a decade of like did okay. anyone ever use that I these, not... these scratch spaces are kind of interesting like uh like some socs have have like memory controllers with um a few fancy features and it's actually something like that i'm quite excited about because uh, when you expose those things to like when those things are exposed, I mean, you can make use of them for writing maybe more interesting coherent data structures, uh, like, uh, concurrent data structures. Um, there's like uh, a few of these um, risk five SOCs. Um, they, they're kind of crazy. Like they're these like shitty little computers with, with uh, like rather low frequency cores, but they have like really cool um, like uh, uh, cache coherence controller and they have like PCI five uh, slots so uh, i don't know like you can really go wild maybe connect an fpga to it so i think that's um like for experimental stuff I, I love it when when soc vendors actually put put lots of features on the board uh yeah well, everyone's doing experiments with them so you gotta you gotta pile on the kitchen sink i'm certain you have a, have another cost model if you wanted to buy one hundred thousand or, or one million units you could argue them off but I don't actually need the uh, sound controller board, whatever. Frankly, all right, we're we're after time. Um, anyone else have any last minute things they want to bring up? Well, I got a that's like moral story. Is we're still at the beginning of computers. All right, Levo, what say say again? Uh, so Alan, um, I think uh last week I was asking about um how to know if I should be rendering tofu uh versus uh not rendering anything at all. When it came to that, uh, there was like a snowman emoji that I pasted that had a, a variance attached to it. I'm, oh, I'm going to make yeah. you guys take this offline. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I was just wondering if Harfbuzz uh, Harf had anything uh, uh, would tell you the answer to that. It was the tofu emoji, Adrian. Do you know about the tofu emoji? All right. Uh, no, no, I don't. No, I'm I don't kind either. of scared of it. <laughs> Yeah, so like the code is the word for every I character mean, that does not appear in your font. All right, yeah, all right, guys, I am going to call it then. So you two well, take well, this. I should talk about it because it's it is a question about my editor or reviewer. Um, so like I did have replacement character stuff in the demo, but then it broke when I was trying to add. I wanted to to display a monospace font too, and then it broke. It crashed because it displayed like a crazy like it it didn't switch the font properly. So it displayed like the proportional font glyphs and like a weird mono space and then with garbage added. Um, but the replacement character stuff does work in the, the free type OpenGL experiments repository. So you, if you want to see how it works, you can look there. It's that's all. I mean, it's not. Yeah, I'll definitely confirm if it handles the 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 specific problem I was looking at. But yeah, OK, yeah. thanks. Yeah, OK, yes. Matt's pointing out this conversation could run on a long time. All right, we're going to end it now, though. Right. And uh, great fun. I had a great time. Thank you all. And uh, Guy was fun. All right, so we meet all right. again. See y'all. See you guys. Bye.